your Bibles and you go ahead and read our scripture for tonight. Revelation 12 and we'll read from 7 through 9, okay? You ready for the word of God say amen? Yeah. And the war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil, and Satan, who deceived the world, who was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Okay, go ahead. Let's sit. Thank you. So, there has been a war in heaven for how long? We'll make this more question and answer tonight, okay? So these are all these are all these films, so this is the time to show your biblical knowledge. How long has there been a war in in, uh, in heaven? Since since Satan fell the first time. And uh, Satan in heaven still has, even though he fell. We know that he still has access to God's presence in heaven. That's a that would be a good study uh, to examine how that works. Because see, I don't think since Lucifer has fell that heaven has been as intended by God. Because you have unholy beings to have access to God's presence. And I don't understand how that works, because we know God does not tolerate the presence of sin, correct? So, I don't know how that works. I, I kind of think that God is, is in a place right now, and I know that, that we can read, what does Job 1 say? Somebody look at Job 1. This has nothing to do with the sermon, but you know how that works. I'm going to look at Job 1 for me, and where does it say, uh, where is Satan talking to God in Job 1? What does it say? There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright. Oh, skip to the Satan part. Um, and one who feared God and shunned evil. Right. Keep going. And the seven sons and three daughters were born to him. Right. Where's Satan come in? Six, verse six. six. And there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them, among them. And they presented themselves before the Lord. Is that what it said? Uh -huh. hmm. I don't know how that works. Does anybody have any thoughts? There's a. It's a. I don't. Huh? Before the Lord. Who, what's the phrase, sons of who? Sons of God. Which are the angels, correct? Sons of God or angels. Lucifer came with uh, the other angels. And does it say presented himself? Came to present themselves before the Lord. And then what does it say? And Satan also came among them. And then what does it say? And the Lord said to Satan, Satan's, but we do know 
that he has access to God because he goes to God and says, Steve's not worth it. He's not, he's, look at it, look at his sin. And he says that about all believers. And we know that he has dominion, he's given dominion over the earth, right? And he is the prince of the power of air, the air above us. And uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 4 speaks to his uh, being the God of this world. And the prince of the power of the air comes Ephesians, Ephesians 2. <coughs> and his, his demon host in Ephesians, further in Ephesians 6, 12, they are said to be spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Okay? So, there's a battle in heaven that has ensued since Lucifer fell. There's a battle on earth that has, that has ensued since the Garden of Eden, the fall of the Garden of Eden. And Satan, along with his evil angels, has actively opposed both the holy angels and God's people since he fell. Since he fell. In the Old Testament, demons sought to hinder the ministry of holy angels. Okay? They, fought, they sought to uh, promote the program of Satan to hinder the angels. We, we know that uh, Daniel 10 tells us that. And in this present age, we know that Satan still prowls around, around uh, like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Still opposing the spread of the gospel, right? Opposing individuals and using sin to disrupt and pollute the church. That's what sin does to the church. It disrupts it and it pollutes it. It's not supposed to be polluted. So believers are to be wary of Satan's schemes and to give him no opportunity by always resisting him. You don't get to resist him only when you're supposed to resist Satan constantly. And the way you do that is by building yourself in the Lord. So the, Lord, uh, the war rages between these supernatural beings which are more real than you and I. That's what I like to think about. And uh, they, they fight in this heavenly sphere that's all around us. And eventually, during the tribulation, this fight will reach its highest point. And in our text it says, Michael and his angels will fight with the dragon. And when you read that in the Greek, the construction of that phrase indicates that Satan will start the war. The angels won't. But this is, a, this is an all-out war. This isn't just the battle that's been simmering. This is an all-out war, and it'll be Satan that will be the initiator of that battle. A good translation would be Michael and his angels had to fight the dragon. Because the dragon fought with them. The Bible, now, we don't know how this fought, this war is fought. Uh, we don't have the knowledge uh, to figure it out. We can speculate. Uh, we know that angels are able to move at incredible speeds. Uh, I don't know if they run into each other. I don't... Uh, we know that uh, they can exist on more than one plane. They can exist spiritually. They can exist on the physical plane. Uh, so, in some way, they battle with each other with whatever powers they have. Uh, and within the parameters, that's how this war is fought. And since we don't know, it, it is hard to, to speculate. But we know that for those that are able to witness this war, it will be a, 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 a spectacular sight in the heavens. And when Michael finally prevails, and Satan is forced out of his access to heaven forever, that will cause a tremendous uh, cry of thanksgiving that really will resound throughout the universe. But the key for us is not how the battle will be fought, but what will cause it. So. Bible scholars, what do you think will be the cause of this ultimate battle being triggered? What will happen? What will we 
know from our knowledge of about Bible that will cause this to happen? Now, if you look at 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, it says, uh, this is a description, uh, I'll ask you what it is after I'm done, you should know what it is, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, that's going to be with him, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, and those who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. To meet the Lord in the air, to me that's a key phrase, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. That's a description of the rapture. So I think, and I'm not the only one, that the rapture will cause this battle to begin. Okay? That's at the beginning of the seven-year tribulation. And why? Because you will have these people are going to be going up through the air. And who is the prince of the power of the air? Satan. And what will Satan try to do? I believe he'll try to stop that. Because Satan knows these words better than we do. And he'll see that the kingdom is coming. And he'll start doing everything and anything he can to uh, stop the fruition of God or of Christ's heavenly uh, kingdom here on earth. So that's, that's a Madeira's conjecture. Uh, there's nothing in the word that, that uh, says that, but there's also nothing in the word that doesn't say that. So to me, it's a, it's a and we do know that, there, that this is, and I'll, I'll give you some additional think, thoughts on that later. But Michael and the dragon have known each other for a long time. They were probably created at the same time. So they've known each other since they were recreated. And they have opposed each other before in the past. Michael is always seen as, in Scripture as a defender of God's people against Satan. Okay? When Michael shows up, the reason he usually shows up is because Satan is messing with people. In Daniel chapter 10, Daniel tells us the, uh, that Michael was dispatched. There's a holy angel dispatched in response to Daniel's prayer, remember? And the, the holy angel says he was delayed for three weeks because he was fighting with a powerful demon and he couldn't overcome him. And then what happened? Michael shows up and defeats the powerful demon and then this angel is free to come and minister to Daniel. Daniel 12, 1 gives us an example of Michael defending God's people. It says, at that time, Michael shall stand up, uh, the great prince, and stand and watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who was found written in the book. So, Michael is a defender, even in the New Testament. Uh, he's portrayed as a defender of God's people. Jude 9, Jude 9, describes his conflict with Satan over the body of Moses. It says in Jude 9, Yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, said, See, Michael, Michael would not speak, for lack of a better phrase, speak badly of Satan, because he didn't want to sin. That's the kind of angel Mark Michael is. But he said, the Lord rebuke you. He leaves it to the Lord to rebuke him. And uh, <coughs> so after Moses' death, Michael was, had to contest with Satan for the possession of Moses' body. Why do you think Satan wanted Moses' body? Yeah, I think he wanted to put him up. Yeah, put a shrine around him. And let the people come and worship Moses. Rather than God. And the people probably would have. You know, he's a very revered figure. But, uh, Michael prevailed. And, uh, in the Lord's power and won the battle. 
happens subsequently. In Deuteronomy 34 to 6, it says, And he, with a big A, H, Jesus buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, opposite, opposite Beth Peor, and no one knows his grave to this day. And no one still knows where his grave is to this day. Because I tell you, if the Jews could find his, his grave, they would, they would worship him. So, significantly, Jude 9, uh, Jude 9 does describe Michael as an archangel. And the only other reference to an archangel in the New Testament is uh, 1 Thessalonians 4.16, where we read, The Lord descends from heaven with a shout of the voice of an archangel. So it would seem that Michael is accompanying Jesus as he, as he comes to uh, begin the, the process of the rapture. That's another reason why I believe that's when the battle begins, as uh, Satan attempts to interfere with the rapture. The reference in our text to, to the dragon and his angels reinforces the truth that the, de the, truth that the demon hosts under, are under Satan's control, and they command... Uh, it's a principle that Jesus spoke of in Matthew 25, 41, where he said, Then he also, uh, say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed into the everlasting fire prepared for you, the devil and his angels. Uh, so, just to reiterate the fact that these unholy angels are under the power of Satan. And the, the word fought in... Uh, the King and the New King James is, is a different word in the uh, original King James, but the word fought is used twice, if you notice in your text. Uh, and that, uh, in verse 7, the war broke out in heaven. Michael was in it, and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. See the repetition? That just is to emphasize the point that this is a very intense all out war. Satan is fighting desperately to prevent Christ from establishing his millennial kingdom, just as he did when he opposed uh, Israel's restoration from captivity. Uh, Zechariah 3, 2 says, And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord has chosen re Jerusalem, rebuke you. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem, rebuke you. Is, is this not a brand plucked from the fire. So, uh, again, uh, Satan and the Lord actually interacting with each other and even Satan being reviewed. So this supernatural war is going to reach a crescendo uh, as the time for Christ to, re to establish his earthly and eternal kingdom draws closer. All of Satan's attempts to oppose God throughout history have failed. And will lose, he will lose again this final angelic battle as well. The devil and his angels, our text tells us, will not prevail. And Satan's defeat will be so complete. What happens to him? Now, there is no longer, there's, there's no, there was no place found for them in heaven any longer. <coughs> so, after the battle, Satan is removed from heaven permanently. So it's like the, the big cleaning crew comes in, okay? And every inch of the heavens is scoured, and all the, the, the cast out, rebellious, fallen angels, <coughs> who include Satan, are now permanently cast down. And they'll have no, there will be no longer any access to God's presence as God prepare, prepares to restore perfection. And we are part of that perfection. You may not feel perfect right now, but later you will. So God will, God will remove that sinful presence from the heaven, and Satan will never again be able to accuse believers before God's throne. And the defeat also marks the end of his reign as the prince of the power of the air. He'll still have dominion over earth, but he will not be the prince of the power of the air. But heaven's cleansing causes a problem because it causes the earth's greater pollution. As Satan is cast out from heaven permanently, 
his fury explodes on humanity when he's cast down to the earth. At exactly what point in the tribulation Satan and his demons are evicted from heaven is not revealed in the word. But in the duration of the battle isn't revealed either. So if my conjecture was correct, where the battle begins at the rapture, all I can say with certainty is that Satan and the demons will, will uh, they could be cast out at the, at the time of the rapture, but I would definitely say that they are cast out by the time of the great tribulation, which is after three and a half years. Because after three and a half years, you see the influence of Satan taking greater form on the earth. And in verse 12 that we're going to study in a couple of weeks, uh, it says that Satan understands that he only has a short time after he leaves heaven. So I believe that Satan is ejected from heaven after a three and a half year battle with the angels. Starting at the rapture, as the as the dead in Christ begin to rise through the air, Satan, who, has, who is the prince of the air, recognizes that and tries to stop them. Tries to stop us the, the, uh, as, we, as we join them in the air. And then that causes the battle, which lasts three and a half years. Satan is evicted from heaven, it says, with only a short time left. To me, that would be at the three and a half year point during the Great Tribulation. During this time of the Great Tribulation, you really see Satan's full power directed at anyone who belongs to God. He becomes much more uh, prejudicial. Prejudicial. What happened? What's the What's the opening event of the Great Tribulation? declaration made it's the, the abomination in the temple that's where the gloves come off okay and that's the DM park that is the that's where that's where the train leaves the station for the great tribulation all right so during that period Satan will show his hand and he will go after God's people, and especially Israel, with new fury. That's the battle that will be fought in heaven, I believe, for three and a half years, for what that's worth. But I'm happy to report that there's a victory. And verse 9 tells us that the great dragon was cast out from heaven. And this describes Satan's second and permanent expulsion from heaven. Okay? And the dragon is called great, not because he's a, a great guy, not because he's, he's wonderful. He's called great because of his ability to inflict harm and to bring about disasters. Uh, remember earlier we saw him portrayed with seven heads and seven crowns and ten horns. And that shows him as the ruler of the world. He's a great dragon. Or a dragon, he's great. So... Uh, John then describes the dragon so that we have no doubt who he is, and he describes him with four descriptions. First, he calls him the serpent of old, which is merely a reference identifying him as the serpent in the Garden of Eden. Who I think kind of, he wasn't really a serpent yet, he was kind of, he was still upright, but maybe he was hunched over a little bit, like the hunchback of Notre Dame. He also calls him a devil, Diablos in Greek, making reference that uh, Diablos means one who slanders, defames, one who accuses. Uh, what does Satan do? He accuses men to God. He accuses God to men. So Satan tells God, uh, as Steve's not good, good enough, take away his salvation. And then Satan will try to tell Steve, you're not good enough, you don't deserve salvation. He lies to everybody. That's his, that's his whole program. He, can't, he really can't do anything else. He's malicious in his prosecution of God's people, constantly trying to 
get them in trouble. I think this is a, when you hear about him prowling about, that's what he's doing. He's seeking evidence to present to God to say, see, you see what I told you about them? They're not any good. But, you know, when we study, remember what we studied in Romans 8, 1? There's no condemnation for those that know Jesus Christ. So when he comes to condemn you, what does the Lord say? Sorry. They were covered by the blood of Jesus. You can't condemn them any longer. So there's no use in trying. Uh, that's in essence what he said about Job. It really is. God never condemned Job. All God did was teach Job a lesson. And he has a lot of lessons to teach us, so be, be careful. But John 2, uh, 1 John uh, 2, 1 says, If anyone sins, that, this, is how this, this is how this works, see? If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. That's why your sins are forgiven. Your future sins have already been forgiven. So, uh, And then back again in Romans 8, 31 through 34, Paul, Paul said, What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Uh, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore, furthermore is also risen, even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. So it shows the futility of Satan's attempts to accuse us. So our text leaves no doubt for us as it next states that, uh, yes, he did. So he, he gives these four descriptions. And then he, did, he, he finishes off by saying, he's called devil and Satan. And then, uh, and that's, that's the fourth description. And Satan is really a, it's just a Hebrew word that means adversary. It means the one who tries to uh, stop someone's plan. So, and it's, a, it's a really a tragic story, the story of Lucifer. Once uh, the most glorious creature ever created. And now, uh, really a, a, a pathetic figure in many ways. Uh, still able to transform himself into a, into a beautiful creature, but I think in his natural state now, I think he's hideous. I think he's, uh, because, uh, remember, what was Lucifer's greatest thing? The way he reflected the light. And now, He's not afforded light. He can't. The light can't touch him because he's he's utter darkness. So he's, he can't even fulfill the way he was created. So from the star of the morning to the adversary, that's a, a big fall. And his original assault was prompted by his desire. It tells us back in the Old Testament he wanted to be like the Most High. And when he failed, he he wanted to bring others along him with him in his failure. And he led Adam and Eve into sin by manipulating them into distrusting the character and the word of God. Because that's what he did. He got them to believe that God was lying to them. Finally, the, describer, the, the dragon is described for us as the one who deceives the whole world. And that word, des, des, deceives, uh, translated present, it's a translation of a Greek present participle, a verb which means to lead, or stray, lead astray or to mislead. And the use of the present tense indicates that Satan is habitual in that conduct. He always is deceiving. Kind of like, kind of like sinners. That's why I always say, what do you expect from sinners? They're going to sin. Don't be surprised when they sin. Satan is habitual in his nature. He's constantly accusing the world, constantly attempting to lead them astray. Beginning with the fall, he's duped the human race throughout its history. Jesus said of him, and again from John 8, 44, he does not stand in the truth, describing Satan. In fact, that really means he cannot stand in the truth. He can't touch the truth. Because there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, it says he speaks from his own resources. It's like he's, a, he's a, a spring springing up out of the ground, and the only thing that comes out of the spring, the water, is all lies. That's what it means by resources. That's the picture. 
So he's a liar, and he is the father of it. So this is he who leads people to their destruction. It says in 1 Timothy 4.1, causing them to give way to deceiving spirits and the doctrines of demons. And the doctrines of demons are some of the doctrines that have been introduced to the church of God. And the picture is of a seducer who gets people to believe him and not to believe God. He gets to believe. What Satan does, he simply gets people to believe that he tells the truth and that God lies. Satan gets people to believe that he tells the truth and that God lies. That's why when people reject the gospel, what do they do? They think God is lying. They may not think of it that way. That's why it's, it's good for them to understand. There was a young man over here this morning, the Spirit was all over him, testifying to him about who and how God is. But he's not sure yet that that's the truth. But his deception will dominate the world during, this deception will dominate the world during the tribulation, and it will get stronger and stronger as Satan gets more desperate as he land, let, uh, launches this last assault against God. And through his agent, the false prophet, an associate of the Antichrist, Satan will deceive those who dwell on the earth. In 13.14 it says that... Uh, uh, that, that that's the way they will operate. He will deceive those who dwell on the earth. And deceitful demons under Satan's control will be able to convince the world's army, the world, it, this is so crazy, these deceitful demons are going to whisper in the ears of the world's rulers and say, let's go fight God. And you know what they're going to do? They're going to say, oh boy, let's go fight God. What kind of sense does that make? But that's exactly what they're going to do. They're going to go to Armageddon, where Napoleon Bonaparte once said, if you were going to have a battle for the, for the entire world, this is the place you would have it. And Bonaparte didn't know anything about Armageddon. Beyond, he knew it was a geographic location. He, he was up in the mountains looking out over the plain of Ar Armageddon, and he said, if you're ever going to have a battle for the world, this is where you would have it. Uh, he was in no way a, a spiritual man, but he understood the, the setting that he was looking at. So, the, the, the deceitful demons will work through, their, work through these leaders of the world and get the armies of the world to go to Armageddon. And Satan will use Babylon, which I, I portray as Babylon in the writings of Revelation as the great end time world economic system. It's the commercial empire. That is run totally by Satan. How? By the mark of the beast. If you don't have the mark of the beast, you can't buy anything. You can't sell anything. You really are non existence without the mark of the beast. So Satan will actively, in, and he will now, in these end times, as the end times get closer, he will energize his servants. They'll be more bold than ever, and he will become actively uh, involved in the deception. Of course, at the end of the tribulation, Satan is thrown into the abyss. It's like a holding tank. That's the way I think of the abyss. Uh, 20, uh, chapter 20, verse 3 tells us that he should deceive the nations no more until the thousand-year reign is over. But during the thousand-year reign, what happens? There's going to be babies born. Those babies will have to get to do something. They have to exercise free will. So what happens? Satan comes back, and he will... He will uh, afford them the opportunity. Verse 8 in chapter 20, he's released for a short time at the end of the millennium. It says to go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth. He does it one more time. But then in verse 10 in, in chapter 20 it says, The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And that means that they will be tormented day and night, forever and ever. So, as they're cast out of heaven, the second expulsion, uh, as it was with the original rebellion, so also our text tells us uh, 
his, his angels are now cast out with him after this second uh, expulsion. Both times, the angels that rebelled with Satan were kicked out with him. Up until this second expulsion, they too have access to the heavenlies. Now they have no access to the heavenlies. So what happens when this section, that second expulsion, they're no more, they are no longer in control of the air, so they only have one thing to do, right? That's run around the earth. They're only, they are, they are restricted. So all of the, all of the nasty angels are now on the earth. And their evil commander is on the earth with them. And that's why in the great tribulation, the horrors, I believe, are so multiplied because there's just so many more demons. They will join all the demons that are already roaming the earth. And the ones, remember, we, we, we saw that there were 200 million demons belched forth from the abyss. 200 million demons. And now you get all these other demons. So you've got demons smorgasbord. So uh, they're going to create a holocaust that will uh, that will supersede anything ever seen in history. Okay. Questions or comments? Anybody? Well, we won't be here in that. No. No, we won't. A good part. Will we see it though? Uh, I think we'll have. I think we'll. Yeah, I think so. Do I think we'll be able to see it from heaven. I think. I think the heavens. Uh, the heavens are like kind of like uh, an elephant looking down at a peanut. The heavens are so. The heavens are everything, and we're we're just this little this little ball. And uh, there's, a, there's a lot to infer that, uh, that uh, the, the rejoicing of the heavens will be because they, they understand and witness what's going on on earth. So I think, I think we'll have access to what's going on on earth. After all, in the millennial kingdom, where will we be? We'll be reigning with our king here in the millennial kingdom. So, you know, I think we'll uh, have a lot of a lot of ability to see and understand. Everything, I think almost everything will be made known to us. Uh, I'm not, I don't think all the mysteries will be revealed, but I, I think the vast majority of them will be revealed. So, any other questions? Any comments? That's it. Well, thank you for coming. <laughs>